Uh, I heard once a good sermon has three points. It tells you what it's going to tell you. Then it tells you. Then it tells you what it told you. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you right now. This is the best news of the day. Jesus is the boss. Now I'm going to tell you what I just told you. Let's pray that we'll get it. Dear Lord, make that truth a clarion call that rings in our souls so that every one of us will say, yes, Jesus, yes, yes, I will trust in you. I will follow you. I will worship you. I will obey you, and I will be your servant for the rest of my life. Make it so, we pray in our, in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22 will be our sermonic text for the morning under the heading Christ's authority. Christ's authority. And yes, that may be summed up in the words Jesus is boss or the boss. And I think it's clearly seen in this passage of Scripture and we'll drive towards that final point where we will be challenged to recognize his bossness in our lives. John chapter 2 verse 18. Jesus has just cleansed the temple. He drove out the money changers and the businessmen who were selling animals in the outer court. Verse 18. The Jews then said to Jesus... What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which he had spoken. For Jesus to cleanse the temple as he did as indicated in the previous verses in John chapter 2, took some gall and utzpah, whatever utzpah is. It was an audacious act. It was not to be done by just anyone. Who was this itinerant rabbi from Nazareth to take upon himself the authority to do such a thing. And thus that raises the question. What authority do you have to do this? The way that it is posed in verse 18 is what sign, they ask, do you show us as your authority for doing this? Again, we discussed this when Jesus changed the water into wine. In verse 11, John writes, this was the beginning of Jesus' signs, which he did in Galilee. The word sign used by the apostle John in this gospel is the word for miracle. So they were asking in verse 18, what miracle are you going to show us to demonstrate to us that you have the authority to do this. Because Jesus assumed authority over the temple. Later, 
He will demonstrate his authority over the Sabbath. Jesus demonstrated the authority over all holy things. What sign do you show us? What miracle can we see you do to show us that you have this authority? And Jesus answered and said, Hang around, because when I'm crucified, three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. But the way he said it confused them. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. By the way, Jesus often did not speak in a clear fashion. Some people wrongly think that Jesus often taught in parables because he wanted people to get it. Actually, the scripture says parables kept people from understanding. You cannot understand the truth of God's word unless given that insight by God himself. He has to take the blinders off. He was not talking about this physical temple they were, they were in, but that was their assumption. And they said, wait a minute. This temple has taken 46 years to build. Herod the Great came to power in 37 B.C. and Josephus says he began to restore the temple in the 18th year of his reign which would be 46 years prior to this moment which was 27 A.D. And it was really only completed just before it was destroyed again by Titus the Roman general in 70 A.D. It's taken all these years to build this temple they said. Will you raise it up in Three days, and then John explains in verse 21, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And verse 22 makes absolutely clear when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered Jesus said this and believed the scripture and the word which he had spoken. So the resurrection of Christ is the, is the miraculous demonstration that he has all authority. I want you to consider the following points that will end up with Jesus as having all authority. I'm going to tell you that, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you what I told you about that. First, the need or the necessity and inevitability of authority. The need or necessity and inevitability of authority. There are those who would have us to think that the way life should be lived is for everyone to just do whatever you want to do in the way you want to do it, whomever you want to do it, because that is individual freedom. Well, I think that we can immediately see that that would result in chaos, arbitrariness, and ultimate anarchy. There is a need and a necessity for authority. And if we're to live together, there's inevitability for authority. By the way, those who want to defund the police would argue we don't need their authority. We need policemen. And I thank God for the police. And I thank God for godly laws. And I thank God for structure that is based on truth. And you just watch these cities where the police are being removed. And you will find people getting out of Dodge real fast. We need authority. There's a necessity for authority. And there will be an inevitability for authority in order that we may live life because of its issues and the questions we face, the complexities and uncertainties and indeed the conundrums of life. We need to make decisions together. We have difficulties together. We have vulnerabilities together. We need authority. And it is inevitable. Second, the moral nature of of authority. Number one is just a preliminary statement about authority itself. Life cannot be lived without authority. 
But number two is the moral nature of authority. The moral nature of authority. Authority requires morality. Morality is the underpinning of authority. Now I want to divide authority into three options ending with moral authority. First there's amoral authority or amoral authority. Write moral and put an A in front of it. It's called the alpha privative. It means unmoral. This means that there is no perceived and acceptable objective morality. There is no absolute morality. And this authority or this perception of authority does not connect itself to morality at all. It tries to do authority without morality. It tries to conceive of authority without morality. Morality, thus without God. But this is vacuous. It lacks intelligence. It lacks sense. Things do not work. There was a famous philosopher who once said, I don't believe in God, but I believe we have to pretend there is a God because that's the way things work right. At least he was honest enough to say, life cannot be lived with the worldview that I have. It lacks perception. It lacks wisdom. It offers no answers or hope. It assumes a morality that it refuses to define and identify. Thus, our morality, as it's connected to authority, is the first phase of the second option. The second option is immoral authority. Immoral authority. This takes a step further. Not only does it deny that there is a God, but it actually substitutes for God its own viewpoints. Thus it lacks goodness. It is arrogant and proud. It assumes too much. It devalues life. Instead of God's authority, it creates human-generated false morality and authority based on human perception and thinking. This immoral authority always degenerates into a devaluing of human life. It destroys ultimately freedom of individuals and it destroys love and kindness in the name of right. In the name of justice, it is unjust. It destroys hope. It destroys joy. You cannot deny God, elevate humanity, and win in the same process. And by the way, this view is rampant in America today. We are denying God, and we are elevating human thought and control. Immoral authority. Third option is moral authority. Moral authority. This is authority based on God Himself. This is authority based on the law of God. This is authority based on the teaching of the Scripture. This is the only moral authority that you can have. It applies structure, but at the same time it ensures human freedom. That is why God's authority applied to human experience allows us to flourish and be created. It maintains a foundation of truth while inspiring creativity. It undergirds love and kindness. It allows for human achievement while caring for those in need. It does not stifle dreams. It encourages work and accomplishment. It does not pacify laziness and inactivity. It inspires dreams and hopes. It provides a framework for ethics, human social interaction, and societal cohesion. This is the only authority that is legitimate. It is the authority based on absolute morality which comes from God Himself. The moral nature 
of authority. I am arguing that that is the authority we need today in our government, in our schools, in our business, in our homes, in our churches. The moral nature of authority. Number three, now that brings us to God. Divine authority. <laughs> Divine authority, which is bringing us back to our text. But to do that, I want to read several passages of Scripture to you, beginning with Isaiah 43. If you'd like to turn there, feel free to do so. But I'm arguing here that God and God alone is the only one who has ultimate authority. That's my argument. God and God alone is the only one who has ultimate authority. Political parties do not have ultimate authority. A federal government does not have ultimate authority. Culture does not have ultimate authority. Education does not have ultimate authority. The ultimate authority rests with God Himself. Isaiah 43, verse 10. God speaking, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and, and understand that I am He. Before there was no God formed, there will be none after me. I. Even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there is no strange God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. I am God. From eternity I am He, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? God reveals Himself as the sovereign God, not as the distant God, but as the God who gets involved, and He has the right to do so. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, God says again, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. There is no God besides me who is like me. Let Him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No. Is there any other rock? I know of none. Chapter 45 of Isaiah. Verse 5, these are just various passages that speak the same thing. He says in verse 5 of the 45th chapter, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun, there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. The one forming light, creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. There is no one who can solve our problems today. There is no one who can even identify our problems. Except God himself. And to deny him in our schools is to choose destruction. To deny him in our government is to destroy our people. And we are watching our cities decay. Because we are saying to God, we will not have your will. We will not have your law. Because we declare ourselves to be God's. Paul said in Romans 11, From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Sooner or later, America will have to face God. Sooner or later, you and I will have to face God. God's authority is intrinsic to His person. It is consequential to His creating all things. It is linked to His love and goodness. It's revealed in Scripture and it is invested in Christ. Divine authority must be seen as the authority that is declared in the New Testament to be embedded in Christ Him 
self. Jesus said after he rose again, all authority, this is Jesus speaking, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I don't know how it could be said any clearer. In all cre reality, authority, ultimate, absolute authority is invested in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is the boss. Whether you acknowledge it or not, He is Lord. He is the one with whom you will have to do at some point in your life. Paul would write in Ephesians 2, you believers are no longer strangers, aliens, fellow citizens, but you're fellow citizens and saints. You're of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the cornerstone. Colossians 1, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and he will have first place in everything. Jesus Christ has all authority. He said in John chapter 10, he has authority to lay down his life on the cross, which he did. And he has authority to take it again. John 10, 18. This command, he says, I receive from my Father. Romans 1, 4 says when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he was declared, I'm quoting Romans 1, 4. He was declared the Son of God with power. By the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. As has already been stated here. One day. Without exception. Every single knee will bow to Jesus. And every tongue will confess to him. That he is Lord. His power and authority are absolute. They are certain. It is His power that saves. It is His power that keeps. It is His power that reigns. It is His power that overcomes. It is His power that delivers. It is His power that heals. It is His power that restores. His authority is unimpeachable, undeniable, unending, and unlimited. And to deny Jesus in His power is to destroy your soul. It destroys all goodness. A world cannot know goodness without Jesus Christ as Lord. And it gives the devil an opportunity. And let me say this about the church, which clearly stated in Scripture. And our church needs to recognize this. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. That means the head of every local church, including ours, is Jesus Christ. Who's the head of this church? Who tells us what to believe? What's right? What's wrong? What should we should do? What our obligations are? What our duties are? Who tells our church these things? It is Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the head of our church. How does He tell us these things? From the Word of God. This is His shepherd's staff. To guide and direct us. Listen carefully to me. No pastor is the head of a church. No pope is the head of a church. No Southern Baptist Convention is the head of a church. No denomination is the head of the church. I say to you without fear of contradiction. Jesus Christ himself is the Lord of this church. He's the boss. He has authority. He has the authority to give hope and salvation to the world. To forgive sinners of sins. To grant new life. To bring goodness into the world. To secure our destiny in glory with Him. And Jesus Christ Himself has been invested with the authority, according to the New Testament, to implement justice. Thus, when He comes back, He will not come back as a, a kind and, and la, I almost said laminous. Was that what a lamb is? A laminous savior? But he will come back as a champion, as a conqueror. And the word of God that goes forth from his mouth will destroy 
all resistance to him. Application. Several things I want to point out to you in now telling you what I've just told you. Sin, number one, sin is a challenge to Jesus' authority. Sin is a challenge to God's authority. Satan rebelled against God's authority and he was kicked out of heaven for it. Sin is antagonism against God, hatred against God, resistance against God's authority. Sin is an attack on God's authority. This is why all evil government will always throw Christians in prison. Because Christians will not bow to the government. We bow to Christ. And an evil government will not abide by any competitor to its authority. And we saw that during the pandemic. States in this country that put pressure on Christians, even Christians in jail, because they simply went to church. That is a government that is out of control. That is a government that will not bow before the authority of Jesus Christ. And any that will not bow before Jesus Christ is an instrument of Satan. It will coerce, it will enslave, it will destroy. Sin is a challenge to Christ's authority. But, secondly, I want to press the appeal. Jesus Christ, here and now, in this sanctuary and online, is calling us to yield, surrender, submit to His authority. He is calling us to His authority. Some of you are being called to salvation. Jesus is calling you through His Spirit. Come and drink of this water that I will give you. And you will never thirst again. Come all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest says Jesus. But this call to salvation is a call to his authority. It is a call to his discipleship. It is a call to yielding. Listen carefully. Jesus' call to sinners is not just to clean you up, not just to forgive you of your sins, not just to make sure you don't go to hell. It is all of that, but it's so much more. It is a call to surrender to Him. It is a call to change in your life, to be different than you've ever been before. It is to be a servant of God for the rest of your life. It is to be born again, to die to the old life, and to rise to a new life in Jesus Christ. This is his call. And it is an authoritative call. Jesus calls us to trust in him. With our faith. Our anxiety. Our despair. Our, our fears. It is to follow hard after him. To honor him. To stand with him. To proclaim him. It is a call to be ready for him. When he comes back. And to live for him. In preparation for his coming. Please consider today, my dear friend, Christ's beautiful perfections and his powerful authority. There is no one like him. You are inept. You cannot change the world. You cannot even change your own life. Your destiny is in a Christ eternity unless you come to Christ and receive Him as your Savior and Lord. The day of your death is coming. Eternity is looming. And judgment is just around the corner. And what about us who know Christ? What will we do in a land that is increasingly showing hatred to those who believe the Bible, who love godliness, who love God, who love the church? What will we do? Everywhere I turn... Everyone I see beckons me to follow, to turn away and flee from the precious one who suffered and died for me. How can I betray him who gave to me his all? How can I deny his love for me and his call? His grave is now empty 
His body undecayed. His life is alive. His authority and power unrestrained. He reaches out to me. He issues to me His command. Follow me. Obey me. Find your all in me. And by His grace I stand. Free, forgiven, alive, renewed. That lures me. Without condemnation I am restored. So I will not listen to siren sound that lures me from his side to dishonor his renown. I will not deny him. I will not turn away. For I will link my life with his and wait for his glorious day. Who will come with me? Who will say yes? Who will make the faithful choice and hope for heavenly bliss? The day is coming when all decisions will be revealed. What you do with Christ Will your destiny be sealed? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that even now your people will rise up and not cower in fear in this day to stand tall, to not give in, to not substitute human ideas and ideologies for your word, but that your people will be clear, that your people will be grounded in biblical teaching on your salvation and lordship. May it be, O oh God, that the church will come home, get cleaned up, and be strengthened by your grace to serve you well until the day of your coming. And I pray that you will increase our tribe. By drawing people to Jesus. In his precious name. We ask these things. Amen.